A very good evening to you all. We warmly welcome you all to the fifth session of Fasi Talks, organized by the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, University of Peradeniya. I'm Panuja Bandara from E16 Batch of Chemical and Process Engineering, and I will be the moderator for today's session. First, let me introduce Fasi Talks to you. ICETOPS is the newly launched initiative by the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, mainly focusing on mitigating the gap between their current academic curriculum and the substantial world of industry and higher education. This program consists of three elements. The first element is a talk series, which is a series of webinars with the industry and an academic professionals. This is accompanied by the second element, a discussion series, which is a stream of casual talks on the most interesting aspects of chemical and process engineering. And the final element is a series of workshops programmed to brush up skills in working with simulation software. session of talk series, ISOTOP 4 was held on 26 February 2022 under the topic Chemical Engineering in Biomedical Engineering and was conducted by Mr. Manula Ratnayake. The links of the previous sessions are available in the chat box for you to watch them leisurely. Today, we are commencing the fifth chapter of the talk series, ISOTOPS number five, to address the theme Machine Learning Aided Computational Catalysis and Material Discovery. And now to begin the today's session, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Asanka Vijayaratna. He graduated with first class honors and as the batch top of E12 batch from University of Peradeniya in 2017, specializing in chemical and process engineering. He was the recipient of five prizes, including the CA Heva Vitarana Prize for the best performance in engineering. Soon after graduation, he joined as a temporary lecturer and served the department for about a year and a half. He's also a Master of Engineering holder from University of Virginia. Currently, he's a third-year graduate student working in the Paul Lucci lab at the University of Virginia, which is primarily focused on computational research in catalysis using density functional calculations mainly focusing on metal exchange zeolites, a widely used class of catalysis in catalytic converters in vehicles. So this is our guest speaker for the fifth session in NASA Talks. And without any further delay, let's warmly welcome our speaker, Mr. Asanka Vijayavad. Sir, so, the stage is yours. Thank you for the kind in introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Am I muted? Can everybody so hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me share the screen first. Okay, I, I hope everybody can see the screen as well. <clears throat> All good? Yes, sir, now we can see the screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, today we are talking about machine learning aided computational catalysis and material discovery. So uh, let's dive to the topic. And uh, this is a very broad topic, I would say. So I would uh, try to uh, be simple and descriptive. So uh, we can discuss questions later. Uh, you may not understand some parts, but uh, it, it's fine. We can discuss all of them later. All right. So uh, to, first of all, uh, 
what is a catalyst do? So that's a question, question number one that I posted. So you can go ahead and answer. This is, you can think about it as an icebreaker question. So, uh, so let's see how people, what people know about a catalyst first. I can see the responses and not the name. So don't be afraid to answer. It's a multiple uh, choice. So you can select whatever you feel correct. Okay. Um, can see responses coming. Okay. Okay. It seems uh, most of you got it correct. So so yeah, so basically the answer is in the, the slide. So it, a catalyst during a reaction, what it does is uh, it, uh, it lowers the energy barrier uh, to the reaction and therefore it enhances the rates, both forward and backward reaction rates and things happen faster. But the uh, initial state and final product does not change and also the energy stays same, energy difference is the same. Uh, so you can see when we analyze the chemical industry, the most processes are catalytic processes. The non-catalytic, there are non-catalytic processes, but they, they only uh, share a small fraction. And uh, when you further break down what types of catalysts people use, you see, uh, most of the time in industrial scale, people use heterogeneous catalyst. And the homogeneous catalyst is still used in industrial scale, but uh, at a lower fraction, biocatalysts such as enzymes are used in very small fractions. So let's see what are the differences and similarities uh, between these, these, uh, these types. So homogeneous catalyst is in the same pace as reactants. You can imagine a liquid phase reaction happening and you have a soluble catalyst like I'm showing here. Uh, this is a organometallic complex which can catalyze, uh, so for, for example, uh, the olefin uh, hydrogenization. So uh, in that case, the, the advantage of this type of reaction is uh, it is uh, well defined. You know what is the structure is, and the catalytic site is highly accessible because it is soluble, right? So you have very limited, or at least you can say no mass transfer limitations in this case. So uh, examples are polymerization reactions, enzyme reactions. So uh, what is the heterogeneous catalyst thing? Well, um, in heterogeneous catalyst you have the opposite case. It is uh, the, you have different phases for your reactant and catalyst. The classic uh, reactant and catalyst combination is gas and solid or liquid and solid, you can say. So in this case, you can easily recover your catalyst from your reaction mix mixture and reuse. So you can now imagine why the heterogeneous catalysts are favorable in industrial scale because the separation process is simpler. Uh, for example, here I am showing ammonia synthesis, which is uh, a widely used reaction. And here the catalyst uh, is solid uh, phase. Uh, so the gas phase molecules react on the surface and then they dissolve. Uh, okay. So there are disadvantages though, because in this case, the solid can have mass transfer limitations because gas to solid mass transfer can uh, be limited due to uh, various reasons. So if you think about industrial importance of uh, catalysis, think about Haber-Bosch process. So you can see there is a direct correlation between world's population, which is in this uh, uh, blue dots and the ammonia production. So uh, that makes sense, right? Because uh, people need uh, to grow food and 
growing food using a limited amount of uh, land need artificial fertilizers. You need fertilizers. So uh, the nitrogen is mainly uh, supplied through uh, ammonia, urea, ammonium nitrate, those kind of fertilizers. So there is a catalytic process that makes ammonia in the first place. So you can imagine without Heber-Bosch process, the population will be way less than uh, what today populations is. So right now we understand the catalyst is very important in day-to-day uh, -day life and uh, industrial scale. So the basic idea behind catalyst is lowering the reaction barrier, right? So how can we estimate those reaction barriers using calculations? Well, uh, for any atomic system, the Schrodinger equation, uh, which uh, the T-shirt form uh, of Schrodinger equation is H psi equals E psi. Uh, it looks like very simple equation, but it is very powerful and it is not as simple as it seems. But the idea is you can get energy of a system using by solving this system. It gives you energy and electronic structure of your system. So for example, in hydrogen atom, uh, the problem is three-dimensional and you can solve it uh, using uh, analytical method, uh, separation of variables. And, but for CO2, uh, the problem becomes uh, larger. Now you have 66 dimensions because you have 22 electrons to describe. So, uh, if you imagine a platinum cluster, then it's 20,000 plus dimensions, which is intractable. So uh, it is hard to solve this equation. Basically what this equation described is the, uh, we, we get the energy, like I said, but it described the interaction between uh, electrons, nuclei and electrons, and those interactions in quantum level. So, uh, okay, now we know we can get energies and estimate reaction barriers, product and those enthalpies using calculations, but it is hard. So what is the solution? Well, uh, the density functional theory offers a solution for this problem by reducing the dimensionality of the problem. What does that mean? Well, uh, like I said, uh, we have three n-dimensional problem to solve if we just consider the wave function. Uh, I hope you remember uh, the wave particle duality, at least uh, from A level chemistry, right? So, uh, so the, if we solve the wave function, it is three n dimensional. Uh, but the uh, density functional theory offers an alternative method to solve Schrodinger equation by uh, solving for electron density instead of wave function. So that is three dimension, which is easy to handle, right? But it is still iterative process and expensive, but uh, comparatively it is less expensive compared to wave functional theory calculations. So it is widely used in uh, computational catalysis. So uh, our research group primarily use density functional theory uh, calculations. Uh, okay, now let's consider a very simple uh, reaction, which is hydrogen combustion. Okay, so, uh, Think how to get reaction in it. Uh, get energy of a H2 molecule using a density calculation and O2 and H2O, then you can uh, derive the reaction energy using those energies. Uh, you have seen this equation, right? So, so you basically need energies to do this. So how do we get? Uh, we solve it, uh, solve Schrodinger equation using density functional theory calculation. Uh, and by energy of H2 molecule, I mean the energy of H2 molecule at equilibrium uh, bond distance. For example, if you consider H2O, you see with when you change the bond angles and bond distances, you, your energy of molecule and there is a minimum energy. So this is the energy that we want to use in order to calculate the reaction energies. 
Okay, this is all good. What you all need to do is just to guess the position of nuclei and the density functional theory will evaluate the energy and minimize that energy iteratively so that you can finally get into this position. And you can do the same for all three uh, molecules that you have here and estimate the energy. That is simple. So also consider that there is a relationship between energy and forces where the force is simply the derivative of energy, right? Uh, I hope you remember the Hooke's law uh, to describe uh, spring. So it, it, the same thing ap uh, applies for the molecule system. Uh, okay, so like I said, density functional theory is still computationally expensive. So we need to use supercomputers in order to solve the system of uh, partial differential equations that describe the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so we can get reaction energies that way. How can we get the reaction rates? Well, right now I'm showing a calculation that I did for a homework problem very recently. So this is an isomerization reaction. You can see uh, the HCN molecule change to CNH. Basically the hydrogen atom moves to the other side of the molecule, which is a very simple reaction. So this each and every point represent a different uh, density functional theory calculation. So you can see the reaction barrier here. If you know the reaction barrier, you can estimate the rate of the reaction using transition state theory that I am stating here. That's all good because here you did not measure anything. You calculate the reaction rate using first principles. You just uh, solve the electronic structure of the system. So this is very cool stuff. Uh, so it, when you move into very complex systems, by the way, uh, there can be different uh, uh, structures for the same stoichiometry. So you need to sample different configurations in molecular space. And also, if you have, for example, say uh, something is breaking, you need to simulate how fast is breaking. What is the load to apply to break uh, that metal, for example? So that is a time dependent problem. So you need to incorporate time into problem. So uh, the way people do that is by using molecular dynamics. It is simple uh, process of uh, solving uh, Newton's equation of motion, uh, which is F equals MA uh, with atomic velocities uh, corresponding to the temperature. So, okay, so what does that mean? Well, imagine you have a molecular system, a uh, lot of water molecules floating around. So you, you, if you uh, can get energy of each uh, molecule and the forces acting on each uh, nuclei, then you can march forward in time uh, using a numerical method uh, by solving for forces and new position. Okay, now you have new positions of the atoms and then you get forces for that new positions and you march forward and you can now progress with time and see how your system of molecules evolve with time. So the forces we can get from density functionality. Like I said, forces are negative derivative of energy. So if you can get energies, you can get forces. So the problem Properties like diffusivity, thermal conductivity can be derived using this uh, molecular simulations, the molecular dynamics. Theoretically, we should also be able to see reactions happening in the system if you wait long enough and your reactions are fast. If your reactions are too slow, you have to wait very long time to see reactions happen, which is a problem. Uh, we will talk about that later. So let's see a molecular dynamic simulation to what is this all about? So this is a CO oxidation reaction. You see there are oxygen molecules, red, and uh, CO molecules, uh, this green, uh, gray and red. And when you oxidize, you form CO2, right? So now you see it's uh, more or less CO2 kind of things are formed over this boron nitride 2D uh, layer. 
So now reaction is complete, I would say, but okay, now it is dissolving. So now that this CO2 molecule is leaving the uh, reaction surface. Uh, this is not actually a movie. This is a simulation uh, uh, which has correct physics in it. So it's not uh, like uh, a cartoon or something. It's it's uh, it's it it is created using uh, solving uh, the Schrodinger equation and Newton's motion equation of motions. So uh, that's all good. You can now estimate reaction rates. You can get uh, the reactions, and this seems pretty well. Uh, the problem comes with the scale. So you saw comparatively small uh, system, which density functional theory is capable of handling. But you see, when you have slower reactions, you have to wait for longer time to see things. So to, with today's computational power, uh, it is hard to uh, simulate, say, microsecond time scale with density functional theory. And also, if you have very large number of molecules, for example, if you want to simulate DNA using DFT, which is impossible. Why? Because DNA is a huge molecule. So uh, in that case, the computational power is not enough uh, to use DFT, even though density functional theory is accurate. So in that case, people use coarse grain methods, which are uh, developed using uh, approximate methods. Let's see what are those approximations. For example, I hope you remember this molecule, right? So this is water molecule. So with angle, the bond angle, the energy change. Now guess a functional form to uh, approximate this uh, behavior. Uh, so that is the question number two. So you can go ahead and answer. So what kind of functional form I can, uh, can use to, uh, to get this curve, this, this, this variation with bond angle. Right now, just assume the bond lengths are uh, same. They are changing a little bit, but uh, let's assume it's same. I'll give you say 20 seconds. It is in the chat, Q2. All right, so, um, okay. okay, good, good. So this is a parabola, right? It's a second order uh, polynomial can approximately describe this curve. So if you fit K and theta, theta you can just guess by looking at theta equilibrium. So that angle is 104, right? It's, it's the minimum. So then you can just measure the angle and estimate the energy. So that's what people do in classical simulations. So uh, people get coordinates of atoms and uh, use the coordinates and some form of analytical expression to approximate the energy of the system. So this expression you can evaluate using your calculator or using your brain. So that is really fast process, unlike density functional theory calculations, which take time and a supercomputer. So that's why it is fast, the classical simulations. But the problem is with this system, you cannot break the bonds because if you have this angle, it just fluctuates it will never uh, react. So that's a problem with classical force fields. Most classical force fields are non-reactive. There are reactive classical force fields. This is called a force field, okay? I'm using a jargon word right now. The force field means an analytical expression uh, that can map positions and energies. So that is a problem. Uh, the reactive things we cannot uh, explain using this kind of models. So that's where the machine learning comes in. So machine learning is uh, not as accurate as ab initio. Ab initio means first principles. So
So the density functional theory calculations are first principles because we do not approximate anything. It is uh, just, just solving for electronic structure. And force fields are approximate methods. So machine learning is uh, in between. So it is fast as these guys, and it is uh, more accurate than uh, force fields. So the machine learning can simulate large systems and large time scales. So both are advantage. So first of all, uh, so, so there are trade-offs actually. In machine learning, it is restricted into a certain region. For example, if your model can describe water and that only knows about hydrogen oxygen interactions. So if you have carbon dioxide, that machine learning model may not be able to describe carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide because those are different elements. But density functional theory calculations, they are first principles. So once you specify the number of electrons and number of uh, uh, protons in the system, it, uh, it can solve the Trojanger equation and give you reaction energies. Uh, but machine learning potentials are not capable of doing that. But once you train, uh, it can describe your particular system, uh, which is still useful. So first of all, what is this machine learning? The very simple way to think about machine learning is uh, linear regression. It's basically a machine learning. Uh, it's simple, but once you find A and B, the, these coefficients, then you can basically compute what is your response is, right? So that should be accurate enough as far as your relationship is linear. Uh, but most physical phenomena are not linear and uh, they have very complex behaviors. So people use different machine learning methods such as neural networks, Gaussian process regression, random forest. There are a bunch of machine learning methods that you can read about. So in neural network, what happens is uh, we, have, we can have multiple inputs and we can even have multiple outputs there are in between layers that do mathematical operations by using these weights uh, to map inputs into output. So you can find these weights in order to map inputs and outputs. That's the idea. However, it can be challenging because this is a multidimensional problem. You can have multiple minima in this weight space W1, W2, W3 can have multiple values that minimize the uh, functional uh, error, error function. Uh, however, there are numerical methods to do that. Uh, the global optimum is what is desirable, which, is, which gives you the best, the lowest error, right? Okay, so let's see how this is applicable in atomistic system. Well, the idea is to find structure property relationship. So first you need to convert your structure into some, some numerical form that you can store information about your molecule or structure, right? So that's called a descriptor. That's another jargon word, a descriptor. It describes the molecule. That's why it is called a descriptor. So your learning model, this is a neural network in this picture, but it can be anything. It can be even linear regression if, if that fits your uh, need. Uh, for example, in my research, I am re researching about uh, zeolites. So in zeolites, I am uh, using Gaussian process regression. I am interested in energy prediction. I will talk about this later, but uh, this is the same workflow people use. Okay, so, so like I said, machine learning potentials can learn energy and force data from density functional theory, quantum calculation. Quantum calculations are expensive, like I said, but machine learning, once you have those weights, you can just plug in and get energy and force. Okay, if it is accurate, why not do that, right? So the idea is to fit machine learning energies and DFT energies by minimizing a cost function. So ideally this cost function should be 
zero, right? If everything match, then it should be zero. But there, there are complexities in system and you cannot get into global minima and those kind of things. So it, it will be minimum, not zero. So you can include force information as well, because like I said, forces and energies are related to each other. So once you find these weights, uh, you can see whether your model is properly trained or not. What does that mean? Well, if you train your model using these dots, and let's say you got this red curve, okay? So this is a test data. This star is a test data set, which this model was not trained on. So model haven't seen this uh, star. So if, if your model predict a value way above or way below the real energy, that means your model just memorized the data that you use. So the properly trained model should give you a comparable testing error. You, uh, the, it, it still has an error, but it is comparable to your training error, where you had, uh, when you are training your neural network or whatever machine learning. Model. Okay. So that's how you verify your model is correct, or at least it is transferable. So these are a few uh, case studies I am showing. So in this case, uh, this uh, kitchen group uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon, they, they uh, studied about palladium oxide uh, formation, palladium surfaces, how different uh, positions on the surface uh, has different energies for oxygen diffusion. This is red, red dot here is an oxygen atom. So this is important because palladium is an industrial catalyst for a lot of reactions. So you see this train and test uh, energies agree very well. This is called a parity plot. So if everything agrees very well, or everything should be on this line, because you see this is neural network predicted energy. This is density functional theory calculated energy. Those should agree, right? They agree and they did a simulation as well. So they produce the density functional theory calculation fairly well. So which is cool because these neural network energy uh, evaluations are very fast compared to this density functional theory calculation. So this is uh, going to give us a lot more advantage. Okay, so that is about atomistic simulation. What about material discovery? Can we use the same workflow? The answer is yes. Uh, here, for example, I'm showing, uh, for example, imagine you have different compositions of materials and you need to know what is the reactivity of your result. If you use this composition, what should be the reactivity of uh, the product? Uh, whether you will be able to synthesize that uh, composition because you can write anything in paper, but can you really synthesize that formula? That's a different question, right? So for example, imagine a binary mixture. Uh, so here you can imagine this as a calcium oxide. We, we know CaO is synthesizable, but Ca2O, synthesizable or not, that's a question. So uh, in this paper, people use different compositional descriptors. They are not uh, atomic positions. They are different. For example, weight, uh, what is the family, what, which group the element is in, what is the ionic radii, uh, those kind of information in order to predict the formation energies. If you have low formation energies, then you will start in materials then you can expect at least uh, at high temperatures uh, to form that uh, composition, right? So, so these are their ma uh, machine learning models. You can see they use different machine learning models and how they incorporate the composition. They use a, a method called one hot encoding, uh, which is a method you don't need to worry about that, but it is simple. So you can see if you need to represent silver in your model, uh, you create a big vector which has uh, all elements. So we give silver one. 
if you have iron aluminum, you, you give aluminum 0.5 and iron 0.5. And if you have CAC2, then you can see the ratio between uh, carbon and calcium is uh, 2 to 1. Okay, So that's the idea. But they train different ma machine learning models. So these uh, names, strange names, they are different machine learning models. You can think about it as neural network versus linear regression. Okay, but they are different. These, these are different models, but they, they have different accuracies. And uh, this one seems worse compared to these two because the, the, you see the parity line and the errors are higher. This one, I think, looks better. But anyways, the idea is they trained a lot of machine learning models. And then they made predictions on new systems. For example, uh, this is yttrium and indium mixture. So what are the binary alloys you can form? What formula? So that is pretty cool stuff, predicting these kind of things. Now you will think, okay, I can even experimentally do this. You can make different compositions, go to lab and synthesize. Why not? Yes, but the problem is uh, you can have ternary systems, for example, uh, or even with four elements, five elements. How can you know uh, and do all of these synthesis? That's why uh, the power of uh, machine learning comes in. Because with these models, you can add any number of elements because your feature vector, the descriptor can represent all the uh, elements in the system, right? So this ternary diagram, for example, is uh, describing aluminum copper calcium system. So you can see these red dots. Uh, so they are the minimum energy structures uh, that you see in the bottom of the hull. Uh, bottom of the energy surface. Uh, so you can see if you want to synthesize something, you need higher amount of aluminum. I hope uh, you remember about ternary diagrams uh, uh, from uh, the subject, which I don't remember actually. But uh, you see, you need a, a higher, higher amount of aluminum and low amount of copper. And, and that's useful information for uh, synthesize uh, a lab, for example. So what about different synthesis conditions? Can you predict those things as well? Yes. Uh, for example, uh, this in this uh, paper, they synth synth uh, predict different uh, synthesis conditions for zeolite synthesis. First of all, what is zeolite? Zeolites are microporous materials. Uh, used in catalysis, ion exchange, and gas separation processes. They basically contain this primary building unit with silicon and oxygen, and but uh, they are bridged in different ways. For example, you see this one has three silicon atoms uh, form a ring. This one has five silicon atoms uh, form a ring. So their ring structures are different. And different zeolites, they have different names, which we denote as a three-letter code. Okay, you will see this uh, in later in the presentation. But the synthesis of these zeolites are very challenging because they basically have the same chemical uh, composition, right? You see, it's just silicon dioxide. But still, their structures are very different, and they are poor volume. Uh, their reactivities for different reactions, their thermal stability, they are very different. So how people synthesize different zeolites by manipulating uh, the temperature, heating time, uh, something we call structured directing agent that we add a small amount into synthesis uh, gel. Uh, those things determine what kind of zeolite that we get in. This is a complex process because Trial and error experiments will take a lot of time, money, and also these structure directing agents are nasty. They, they, they are environmentally harmful. So it is good that we have a model that can predict uh, what is the output. If you use this temperature, this amount of uh, time, and so on, right? So that's what they did. 
they extracted available literature from uh, different uh, research reports uh, and synthesis labs. And they train a machine learning model that can basically predict if you use this temperature, what should be your output? If you use this silicon to aluminum ratio, what should be your output? And so on. This is good because uh, now, now that you gathered information and not only your model know what is already known, but also it can predict new synthesis conditions that can be optimum. For example, who want to use high temperature synthesis condition if a low temperature synthesis conditions gives, gives you the same output, right? But people haven't tried it, but you can just generate a lot of temperatures. You can do design of experiment uh, kind of uh, generations and see what lower temperature can give you the same zeolite. So in my research, I do a similar kind of research by uh, predicting the relative stability of cations in zeolite. So like you can see here, the cations in zeolites uh, are important because they have catalytic activity for some reactions and as well as they have uh, NO absorbent uh, properties. Uh, so if you want to uh, make a good NO absorbent, then uh, how can you do that? Well, the binding energy of NO should be very high because then it can store NO, right? But the problem is you can have multiple uh, cations and we know there are a lot of zeolites as well. Uh, and there are actually around 250 types of zeolite and we have how many cations. So it's not possible to do synthesis, of course, and it is not possible to even do density functional theory calculations on all of these structures. So what we do, we, we train a machine learning model basically. So the idea is to get the structure uh, and encode that details in the structure to uh, something called uh, a structural descriptor and train a machine learning model that basically predict the cation exchange energies. So, like I said, I'm using Gaussian process regression. So here you see Gaussian process regression uh, output. So you can see uh, right now our model has only two cations. We are uh, increasing the number as well. So we can, the insights that we get from machine learning model is the local environment of metal ion is highly uh, correlated to its energy. Uh, and also the nice thing about this model is a single model can incorporate multiple zeolites and multiple cations. That is very important because your model is trained on density functional theory calculations. So if you generate little amount of density functional theory calculations, which, which are somewhat expensive, you need to use supercomputing power to do that. Now, basically you can use your regression model to predict uh, the energies on other zeolites, which is very fast process. And you can basically throw any uh, kind of structure that you would like to investigate and see what is the energy. So that is important. So like I said, in our research group, uh, we do primarily research on computational catalysis. So I'm working on zeolites and Keka also working on zeolites. So uh, any other people uh, basically work on surface catalysis and uh, rate estimations uh, and 2D uh, catalysis, uh, those kind of applications. So uh, this is our advisor, Chris Paulucci. So uh, I will go through uh, some high level uh, overview of uh, what other people do in our research group so that you can get a flavor of what computational catalyst uh, generally, generally means. So uh, Anna does uh, calculations on silver oxygen surfaces. Why it is important? Well, uh, silver is an industrial catalyst for ethylene oxide uh, uh, manufacturing processes. So uh, ethylene oxide is very important uh, 
reactive intermediate, which is uh, for polymers, detergents, and uh, anti-freeze materials. So uh, the challenge in this project is under reaction conditions, the measurement of surface properties is hard. And the density functional theory calculations uh, are also hard because the time scale to reconstruct the surface, catalyst surface is longer. So that's why she uh, trained a neural network uh, model to uh, do molecular dynamic simulation. So you can see these lighter silver atoms are different from others, not only in uh, color, it's the coordination is different. Initially, the everything looks perfect, right? Everything looks uh, very ordered. Uh, it's like a lattice. But after some time, the order is gone. So this is how the real catalyst surface looks like. So, so this is very important uh, finding uh, in order to understand what is happening under reaction conditions, which is not, of course, possible alone with DFT. So this neural network did all the simulation. And from time to time, she is calling density functional theory just to verify whether the energy she is getting from neural network is correct or not. That's what she is doing with these dots. Okay. So I think that is uh, clear. So this is Anu's uh, project. She is doing uh, calculations on molybdenum carbide surfaces. So you see these nice shapes. To In order to form the uh, nanoparticle shapes, you need minimum energy surfaces because nature tries to minimize energy of a particle in general, in thermodynamic limits. So how you get minimum energy surfaces, uh, that's where she used machine learning. So you see these phase diagrams, they are actually a first principle based phase diagram. You see in different particle sizes, you have different phases of molybdenum carbon. So this is important in synthesis. So uh, you can imagine now you can decide synthesis conditions based on machine learning models. You can predict reactivities based on machine learning models. So there are a lot of things that we can do with data sets. So Suganda and Keka, they are doing uh, calculations on microkinetic model and uh, density functional theory calculations with uh, sulfur poisoning. So they use less uh, DFT, uh, sorry, machine learning. So useful skills in this area, uh, coding is of course useful. Uh, I had uh, uh, coding experience when I joined uh, University of Virginia uh, with MATLAB. I did not have Python, but now I think a, a department is shifted to Python, which is good because it is open source and uh, there are a lot of uh, open source codes and machine learning, especially uh, with Python packages. So I think it's a good movement that uh, uh, the department took. So also the chemical uh, knowledge is important. Uh, how molecules look like, what are their bond angles, how reactive are they. So this kind of knowledge, I think we all do have. So that is important uh, when doing research in uh, catalysis. And system modeling and system level thinking is very important uh, uh, skill, uh, which means you need to break down a big system into a small, simpler uh, sub uh, topics that you can easily handle. And then you need to reintegrate to get the final uh, system level performance. For example, in a catalytic reactor, this is how it in large scale looks like. This is still an schematic, uh, but uh, you can see you have catalyst pellets that are extrude into different shapes. You can have different shapes, but these pellets have for example, here they are describing it as zeolite crystals. So zeolites are catalyst supports actually. So these are heterogeneous catalysts like you can see. So gas enters here, gas is there. So here the reaction happens. So in small scales, you have these kind of tiny crystals. 
and even in smaller scales you have atoms so how can you integrate these kind of uh, length scales that's very important uh, skill that uh, we we need to learn and also when you uh, make a model at what scenarios that breaks down where can you apply that model you cannot do uh, make a universal model that describes everything right okay well schrodinger equation describes uh, everything but uh, like i said it's hard to solve for the uh, most of the system and also of course chemical reaction engineering like i said uh, suganda in our group she used uh, these kind of microkinetic models where you have a lot of reaction rates and you don't know exact value of them but you know the range of values so you optimize parameters to get uh, the system level so uh, those are in general useful skills so what are the uh, Use, uh, so I'm here just throwing some useful uh, websites, uh, databases that you can learn these kind of things. Uh, so you, I will distribute these slides later. So you can uh, go ahead and uh, check these things yourself if you are interested in. I'm happy to uh, answer questions if you have later, okay? So in summary, the length scale and time scale, uh, are there is an interdependence. So if, if you, you can go to a very small uh, time scale and uh, system sizes with very accurate methods like uh, wave function theory calculations, density functional theory calculations, so on. However, when you increase the system size to a real uh, world size, uh, you cannot uh, solve uh, density functional theory calculations. So you need to integrate these two. So machine learning models, uh, provide an intermediate uh, position where you can integrate uh, those different uh, length scales as well as it has uh, advantage from uh, different level of simulations uh, like I'm showing here. So it is fast and uh, it can handle large systems. It's fairly accurate, but it is uh, very specific to the system that you develop which is not a big problem. Because if you are just uh, trying to model, say, CO oxidation reaction, you don't care about water, right? It's just CO plus O2 go to CO2. So you just care about that system. So uh, it's not a big problem. Reliability can be a problem because this machine learning model, like I said, sometimes fail because the finding the global minimum is hard. Uh, so it does not know anything about physics. That's a big problem because it, it know, it just, it's a just black box model, right? It just had input outputs, it mapped. It doesn't know physics. It doesn't know anything about electrons. So that can be a problem sometimes. Uh, so that is the end of the presentation. So uh, if you have questions, we can just discuss. And if you have questions about in general, graduate life or whatever you can ask. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for the insightful address to our topic today, machine learning aided computational catalysis and material discovery. It was indeed very informative and helpful, and I'm sure many of us got inspired today. Here's the time for another interesting segment, the Q&A session. The audience, we are ready to give you the opportunity to raise your questions. You can use either raise hand option or chat box to send your queries. I will narrate your question to Mr. Sankar Vijayaratna. I hope everything is clear and this opportunity is yours to get your doubts clarified and enrich your knowledge. Right, uh, this is Nadish here. Can I can I ask a question? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Go ahead. Right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Asanka, for your insightful uh, talk about uh, because it's it was a bit sensitive to me because it's as well because it's into materials and material discovery. So regarding uh, so I have some few questions because uh, we did some DFT long long time ago. 
So I just wanted to see the update. I mean, what is happening right now? So that is the whole idea because I am not practicing any uh, theoretical work right now. Fully, I'm I'm into experiment. Experiment. Uh, so DFT in DFT methods, as far as I remember, uh, you know, to model molecules atoms, uh, we use the basic set, right? Uh, like yeah. uh, to to you know <clears throat> get a sort of a you know the uh, we call it linear combination of all molecular orbital, uh, you know, yep. like uh, Los Alamos. I remember that uh, basis set from Los Alamos laboratory here and there. So at that time, we did some calculations. So it's still like, do we have like, you know, uh, super cool basis sets right, right now or still we are using like LN, LN 2D Z if I remember. That's what I did. That's what I use. So any advanced... Yeah, so Right now, uh, the basis, the number of basis sets and also the complexity of basis sets have grown up because uh, uh, the computational power, of course, uh, now is uh, higher compared to early days. So, yes, so uh, right now uh, we we have number of basis sets, but the, the thing is, uh, if you need to uh, estimate very accurate energies, uh, then you have to go for a bigger uh, basis sets. So, uh, and uh, better methods. So method and basis set is correlated. Uh, and also the computational power is high, right? So of course you cannot do, cannot offer to have very accurate energies, very accurate basis sets and all of that and a long MD simulation, that's impossible. But uh, ideally, that's what we need to do. However, in reality, uh, what we do is, for example, if you want to do a geometry optimization, first you do it with a, a small basis set, and then at uh, close to minima, you go switch to a large accurate uh, basis set. So that's how uh, things are still happening. Yeah, so you do use, uh... Methods like B3Lip still it is it yes uh, B3Lip is still used and uh, uh, meta GGA functionals people use uh, and yeah B3Lip is still in use. Right? What is the software or something you are right now? Yeah, using we it. are using Wasp. Uh, we have a license, uh, but uh, I know uh, Quantum Expresso is open source uh, and some of uh, groups in UEA, uh, the University of Virginia, people uh, use them. Uh, the open source uh, quantum software. So I think the gap between uh, paid ones and open source ones are shrinking right now because a lot of developers are uh, trending to open source software. So, yeah. We, we use uh, Gaussian dose. Is it available? Is it is it, yeah, it is It is available. The, the calculation that I showed uh, what I did for the homework, uh, it's, it's a simple reaction. Thing, if you remember so that i did use in gaussian yes right so the last question uh, so what is the cluster site i mean in terms of the number of atoms you know you are dealing i know that determines many things right i mean everything basically so what is the your cluster site yeah so uh, these are solids uh, so in gaussian uh, it's it's hard to do uh, it's actually impossible to do a solid calculation it's just clusters maybe that's why you were asking this question uh, in wasp it's it's specifically designed for solids you see this uh, cell the 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 uh, dashed line so this cell repeats yeah in it's all it, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, so in that case it is the size of unit cell that uh, we should uh, talk about so uh, in general dft can easily handle uh, hundreds of atoms uh, thousands of atoms it it cannot uh, handle yeah. uh, it's uh, too uh, expensive to do those calculations so yeah clusters if you have 100 atoms well yes we can do dft now great thank you Asanta, for right uh, and also thank you very much for you know accepting the invitation and giving my talk yeah, now I think uh, students want to ask some questions. If you want to ask, go ahead. Thank you. You can go ahead.
So if you can, uh, if you have any more questions, you can ask now. Uh, just question in the chat box. Well, yeah, uh, it was very. Can you explain the way that how you make the link between outputs from ML and numerical simulation? Okay. Uh, I don't think I understood the question fully, but uh, the way I think that is, okay, so the numerical simulation, the, I think it is, uh, he's asking, he or she is asking about, uh, uh, the ML is a black box model, right? So the numerical simulation, if it is say deterministic model, uh, for example, the classical force fields are deterministic. They have analytical expressions that we can evaluate and we get an answer, which is, uh, and the equations, we know what equations that is, right? So how can we compare those two? Well, uh, the problem with, a numer uh, I don't know, I understood the question correctly. If, if I am going wrong direction, please, uh, please uh, speak up or just put another uh, message in the chat. But uh, if you compare numerical or the classical simulation, the problem is they can be too simple to describe things because the harmonic approximation that I said this is a simple expression, right? Maybe there are complexities that are not covered uh, with this expression. Even though this is very fast to uh, evaluate and that is a very huge, uh, it's a huge advantage, but uh, it, it can fail to describe certain phenomena. So how can we compare? Well, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. That's all what I can say. Uh, yeah. The ML, for example, can capture very complex phenomena. For example, reaction, machine learning based potentials can capture uh, reactions because uh, we don't care about the bonds when we are developing uh, machine learning, most machine learning potentials. But here we define bond already, right? Otherwise you cannot make uh, and uh, measure an angle. So that's a trade-off actually. I think I, okay, maybe let's check the, okay, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Arnab Premrath for asking your question. And uh, now any of you can ask any question if you have. Uh, Akila has face hand. Uh, you can ask your question now. Hello, sir. Uh, I have, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it is not related to, uh, not directly related to your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, during our, this is, uh, I'm a final year undergraduate, and during uh, this final year of studies, uh, what should be our key concerns to secure uh, scholarship uh, in terms of PhDs and uh, masters as well. Can you uh, help me with that? Yeah, I think uh, there are a few things. Uh, first, the research project that you are doing. So uh, you should try to do it in your best and uh, and by doing so, uh, you can get an idea how research looks like, how, how it feels, uh, whether you like it or not. So first consider uh, whether you really like research or not, right? If it is not, well, when you are doing PhD, you are basically doing research. So that's not for you then. Okay, then if you have realized it's, it's your, uh, passion to do research. Okay, that's first thing is done. Then what? Uh, then I think uh, uh, publications, conferences, going to conferences and uh, giving talks, uh, that helps uh, strengthening your application. 
And right now I know GRE and uh, GRE requirements are waived from a lot of institutions. Uh, there are some institutions that still required uh, if you are applying for a US institution, but uh, countries like Australia and most Canadian universities, they don't need GRE. So uh, that's not a concern, but uh, yeah, those are the general things. And uh, and I think it helps that if you have an upward trend in your GPA, for example, even if you entered and struggled with some uh, courses, but still you managed to get uh, good grades, uh, good recommendation letters at the end of your uh, uh, final year, I think uh, that helps a lot. Uh, thank you, Akila. Now you can ask the question. Thank you, Tanoja. Uh, sir, uh, there are several countries at the top of the list when it comes to the higher studies in the field of chemical engineering, and USC is at the top of them. And so, can you elaborate on uh, what's the difference? The, what, what are the main differences between the other countries and the uh, uh, these higher study programs in USA? Mm. Okay, maybe I'm not the best person to answer this because I have only experience in US, right? So what I might compare to, but I can share my experience, honestly. So here the PhD program is structured. I think that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's somewhat different from other countries. Uh, by structured, I mean, uh, it is integrated to coursework. Uh, so you basically take advanced, uh, graduate level coursework with your research. For example, in my first year, I took uh, seven uh, classes, seven uh, courses, uh, I think seven or eight, it doesn't really matter, like that much of courses. Like for example, mass transport, I, I got a uh, course for that, which is going beyond the uh, undergraduate level. So that helps research and uh, your personal development. I think that's a, that's a different uh, compared to other countries. And some courses are actually mandatory uh, to take. So you don't have an option uh, to take. And some courses, for example, the computational chemistry course that I'm taking, it's, uh, it's because I'm doing research on that area. So I am taking that course. So I think that's a big difference. And uh, also I think funding is a bit stronger here because of course US is, uh, it has a very good economy. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah, I think the industry collaborations are at like very top as well, because uh, right now, even we, even we are doing computational uh, work, we still, uh, do industry level research. Uh, for example, we have meetings with Cummings, which is a uh, vehicle catalyst, the automotive catalyst company. Uh, so uh, we are doing catalyst poisoning studies with industry. So industry, uh, academia collaborations are still uh, here. It's very strong, uh, but I cannot compare it to other countries because I don't have an experience. So it will not be fair to compare, but that's my experience uh, as far as concerned US. Um, maybe I can add, add a little bit onto that. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting, Sanka, <laughs> but uh, I'm actually, so if you guys don't know me, I'm actually a friend of Asanka who lives here in UVA, so we live close by. I'm a graduate student in the chemistry department, so, uh, one of the one of the main reasons that uh, most of the higher ranking universities are in USA is because, like Asanka said, there is a lot of funding here, and because of that, there are a lot of facilities that are available for everyone. Like for example, like Asanka said about the supercomputer that we have, so there are like multiple universities in the US that actually has supercomputing uh, in their university. So because of that. 
a lot of students are able to do like many advanced calculations and things like that. And as also another thing that comes into the ranking is the diversity. So diversity is something uh, if you guys don't know about it. So diversity is uh, basically like, uh, for example, like if you have, so, so for example, if you take a census group, you can see that there are like students from India, students are from like Asia, Europe, and US, and at the same time, like Asanka is from Sri Lanka. So, uh, so here you can see that the, the, the professor is a US professor, but you have students from various other countries. So uh, one of the main things when it comes to research groups here is that you, that the, the diversity actually accounts into how much funding you can get. So the, the funding agencies, when they give up uh, money for these labs to work, they actually check that just to make sure that you have uh, your your students are not like uh, focused on the US. For example, like your lab is not completely US students, but uh, there are students from various other countries. So I think because of the fact that other countries doesn't get much students from other like various countries, I guess that that kind of uh, counts into some amount in the funding. And also in the case is that in the US, there's a, a large amount of money that's been uh, put forward to research and development. And there's multiple funding agencies like NIH, uh, even, even like industrial companies, like, I don't know, for example, like Shell or uh, even car companies like Rolls-Royce, they, 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 give out money for the university. So for example, like in our university, the, the mechanical engineering department is fully funded by the Rolls-Royce car company. And they have give out like 20 3D printers and even we, even the mechanical engineering department has a flight simulator that was given just so like people can experience that. And at the same time, they do work that's helpful for that company. So, and the, 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 the also, the mechanical and electrical engineering department gets a lot of contracts from the military. So if the military has a lot of money, so for example, I mean, the US military is one of the powerful militaries in the world. So they have a lot of money that, that they can give out. So they give that money to universities because they need uh, research and development for their stuff. Like, for example, like if they want to build like an autonomous uh, 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 army tank or something, they would give out money to the, uh, the engineering department to do that. And they continuously monitor that too. And they're like, they're like these universities, they, they, we, we do like really, uh, sometimes these contracts are like highly classified. So the students have to go through like multiple clearances to do those kind of things. So it's a really big area for research. And also you, again, you get a lot of money. And the fact that UVA is one of the, all the schools in the country, and it's been it was founded by one of the uh, presidents in the United States. It's it's a high-ranked university, and it's really difficult to get in. But adding to that, I think if you uh, if you check the requirements uh, that you need, so I mean every university uh, they have a uh, the department website that you can go to, and then you can check the requirements. So I believe that UVA in most cases have uh, removed the GRE requirement, but they still need the IELTS or TOEFL requirement. So you can uh, go and see like what are the scores that they're looking for. And if you are like uh, somewhat higher than the minimum requirement that they're looking for, chances are you might, you can get in. So that's something to probably add. I know, I don't know whether it helped, but I hope it helps. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. It, it helps, actually. I, I think at least I can add a little bit. So uh, so with that industry funded, uh, that's a that's a uh, very uh, it's, it's a very accurate description that he gave. So even uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, there are research grants that we get from those those institutions, which are multi million dollar uh, dollar grants. So I think that also helps uh, having high end, uh, high quality research. Oh, um, actually, Asanka, I had one question. Uh, you, you talked about descriptor uh, numbers. 
for like yeah. molecules. I, I, I was just curious because I, I don't know anything about this uh, area mm -hmm. of study. But uh, I was just wondering, like, when you give a like a descript when you make a descriptor for a certain molecule, like you said that you input some numbers into it. So does those yeah. numbers so, depend on the molecule or like how, yes. how do you so select? Yes. So actually, Viranga, there there are multiple descriptors. Designing descriptors itself is a huge area. It's a research area. So the descriptor should describe what is the material. It should capture what is the material property relationship is, right? Otherwise, the, the model cannot learn anything. If, if your descriptor fails to capture physics, your model cannot learn anything. So, yeah. uh, so the descriptor that I am using is a Gaussian transformation of interatomic distances and interatomic angles. Uh, which is position-based descriptor. But uh, say, for example, if you want to predict synthesizability of a certain molecule, then the positions may not make much sense. Uh, in that case, it will be more useful to use atomic descriptors, such as uh, in this case, they don't use dis the distances at all. So they, they use only atomic uh, descriptor. So descriptor can be anything that can describe the system. But for our the interatomic potentials that governs these uh, movies, uh, the MD simulations, for them it is mostly position based, uh, the coordinate based uh, uh, descript, uh, the the numerical representations. It can be some transformation. Uh, there are spherical harmonic transformations, Gaussian transformations, uh, different uh, transformations people apply, but still they are distance-based because forces and energies, they depend on the distance. If you ignore distance, uh, I don't think we can capture that uh, force energy district, this uh, distribution. So yeah, it depends okay. on the thing that you are modeling. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Viranga Vimalasiri, for your question and for the clarification. Uh, there are any more questions you can ask them. Uh, it seems like uh, all the clarifications are done. So. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your invaluable experience gathered in your uh, exemplary journey so far. Your explanations for our questions were easily understandable and valuable for everyone. We are now certain that our students are aware of another engaging part they can undertake as chemical engineering engineers. And now I would like to invite Mr. Pasindi Jaisuria, the Vice President of the Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students, to propose a vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure and honor that I express my heartiest gratitude on behalf of Society of Chemical and Process Engineering Students to acknowledge the contribution of everyone, those who dedicated their time and effort to make today's event a huge success. First, I would like to thank our guest speaker, senior graduate Asanka Vijay Radner, not only, for, not only for sparing his invaluable time to share his experience in the field of chemical engineering, but also for motivating us to push our own limits and strive for the best. Thank you very much, sir, for being part of making this event a success with a fascinating talk. Next, I would like to extend my gratitude to our beloved academic staff of Department of Chemical and Process Engineering for their ceaseless and generous contribution and encouragement to all of our efforts. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants who joined with us today in the middle of your tied up schedules and the committee members of SCAPES for your commitment in organizing such a remarkable event. Once again, thank you everyone, stay safe. And now we have come to the end of this amazing session. Hope you all had a wonderful time with us. Thank you everyone for joining us today amidst your busy schedules. So with the hoping of meeting you again on another memorable day within, with an inspiring topic, it's time for us to wind up today's session. 
Good night, everyone. Stay safe.